Thank you. Thank you, and um, good morning to everyone. Uh, it's really an honor to be here at the starting and the restart of the Creative Mornings. Um, so, um, I was thinking about uh, today's theme uh, when I prepared for this, and uh, the theme of now. And I realized that we're often told that we should live in the present, we should live here and now, we shouldn't dwell too much on the past, and we shouldn't really think too much about our future because we get all anxious. But I think that that would be highly inefficient, at least from a creativity standpoint. I think and I believe that we should think much more about the future. So that is um, what I will talk about today. Um, I uh, have been working uh, with 25 years, sort of, with uh, creativity and innovation. Uh, I've worked with various industries, uh, but the last five years I've worked in textile and fashion industry trying to use disruptive innovation in order to have the fast fashion industry transform into more circularity. So that's basically what I've been doing. So I will try to kind of uh, mix some creative takeaways for you guys together with some insights from the fashion and textile industry. Um, I think that creativity is uh, kind of interesting because when you start off with creativity, you often do everything right. So I don't know if you have been to a lot of brainstormings, but typically when you start, you have, you know, you have all the coffee and candy and you have the excitement and you have the curiosity and you do all the right things. And the result is splendid. It's, it's a very good result often from the start. And then you say, well, this was great. We, we need to do this more. And then you start to think about, you know, how can we do this right? And what should we do really? And then the creativity decreases. It's like when you're playing piano or, or drawing, you know, as soon as you start thinking about how you're pressing the keys or how you're holding the pen, the results get worse. So the more you think about creativity, the harder it gets until you reach a certain point. And at that point, you try to un you understand that what you did in the beginning was the right thing. So you understand that the coffee and candy, the <laughs> excitement and all that thing, that is the important thing with creativity. But then you do it on the conscience level. So you start doing all these basic things that you did right from the start, but you do it on the conscious level. And if you get past this focusing on creativity for a long time, there is basically no limit for how creative you can be. So I think that creativity is a skill that you can acquire, but you need to do it for a period of time. Um, one of the things that you uh, realize very early is that it's not really about the ideas being creative, it's much more about the uh, questions. And uh, you probably all know this. You know, like if you have a problem, like how can we end world hunger? Well, you can ask a different question. You can say, how can we produce more food? How can we share food better? How can we make sure there's no food waste? So, depending on the question, you get different answer. And this typically you realize very early that it's all about, you know, asking the right questions. Uh, so here's the first takeaway for you guys. Uh, this is related to this. It's about uh, the closer you get to the problem, the less likely you are to ask the right question. And what do I mean by that? Well, uh, let's say, for instance, I need to get into shape this summer. Well, it's a problem very related to me. And the thing that you do then is you start asking the different questions. You say, well, I need to exercise more, I need to eat, right? Or you can ask the question, how do I collaborate with others that inspire me in order to exercise more or whatever? Same thing with the companies. So currently a lot of companies working with sustainability and maybe it's very imminent, you know, how can we become a more sustainable company? But the closer the question gets to the company, the less tendency there are to ask all these different questions to change perspective. So that is my first takeaway for you guys to think about. Second takeaway, there is an implicit now uh, to all questions. See how I connected to now theme again there, so <laughs> just have to observe that. Um, well, 
if you say, for instance, you know, how can we become more sustainable as a company now? We don't say now, but it's still there. So almost every question that we ask that we want to be creative around has an implicit now connected to it. And there is a problem with that. Uh, it's because you also see all the problems, all the systems that exist now. So the fact that you move yourself or the question into the future releases you from the current system that you have today. So how can we become more sustainable in 10 years? How can I get into shape in 10 years? Then I don't have to bother with all the current system and it's easier to become creative. So when it comes to sustainability, everyone is talking about the 2030. And my mind is occupied with, then what? What do we do 2030? So let's say we reach the goals of sustainability by 2030. How do we become climate positive after that? That's a more interesting question, I think, to ask already now. So what I want you to do is to, when you have problems that you want to be creative around, uh, try to put them in the future. Try to put them, ask how do we solve this 10 years from now? So more questions, uh, put them in the future. Uh, the third takeaway is that scenarios will help people be creative. Uh, I actually read a study uh, last month uh, related to this. You know, how do you get other to be creative, other people? And uh, I don't know which kind you are, but some people are kind of think it's a bit pressure being creative. I think it's, you know, now we should come up with idea and they feel all anxious. You know, you, now I need to be creative. I have a hard time being creative. And there was a study uh, saying that scenarios is one of the best ways or, or the best way actually to help other people that normally don't work with creativity to become creative. I'll show you some scenarios in a second, but uh, before that, I will talk a little bit about the fashion industry. So, a question to you. Uh, a t-shirt, 1500 crowns for a t-shirt, is that a fair price? So, question for you. How many of you would buy a t-shirt for 1500 crowns? Raise your hand. Yeah, you get some rich people in here, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now you probably think, well, he probably means a very specific, special t-shirt. No, I mean a regular t-shirt, 1,500 crowns. Almost none here think that's a good price, right? That is probably the price that it would cost in Sweden to produce a t-shirt. So if we produce the t-shirt in Sweden, that's typically what they would cost, probably. Uh, so if you think about, you know, the effort creating a t-shirt here in Sweden, we will end up with that cost. So what about 50 crowns? Let's say 50 crowns. Would that be a good price? How many think that 50 crowns would be a good price? Yeah, a little bit more hands up here. 50 crowns uh, seems fair. But then you have to think about how do we create t-shirts? We farm cotton. We spin cotton to yarn. Then we produce a weave. Then we sew that to a t-shirt. And then we color it or dye it so to get a specific color. Uh, and normally 40% of the price is for the resellers. So around 30 crowns, that is the whole press process from cotton fields to a ready packaged t-shirt. And many people think that that is a fair price. Well, uh, you have probably heard the expression, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Well, there's no such thing as a t-shirt for 50 crowns. If you buy a t-shirt for 50 crowns, you can be sure that someone else is paying. It's not only you that is paying. So that is the situation that we have today. So let me give you some uh, insights about uh, textile industry. Uh, typically, we have textile uh, on our body 99% of the time. Uh, now you probably start thinking about what you are doing and when you don't have textiles, but uh, normally you will end up saying that, well, in the shower, uh, that's the, the only time during the day that you don't have any clothes, any textile next to your body. And the first thing you reach for when you get out of the shower is textiles. So we have textiles everywhere. And that is part of the problem. We don't think about textiles. We don't think about it very much because it's always there. 
And if you look around you here, you see textiles, you know, everywhere. Um, we can also do a little experiment here. Uh, normally we have at least five pieces of clothes on us. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, something like that. And then you can calculate uh, saying that how many people are we, let's say in Sweden, we are a small country, 10 million people, something like that. So five garments, 10 million people, that's 50 million garments that are in use right now. If you think about, say, let's estimate 10, gar 10 settings of garments at least, we have all the people that are in here today. So then we are with 500 million garments in Sweden that we own today. Then we haven't calculated all the working clothes, the rugs, the curtains, the towels, the sheets, all that. So basically there's loads of textiles. If we think about the world, 8 billion people, 5 clothes, that's 40 billion pieces of clothes that are used right now, basically. So it's a huge, huge problem. If you think about the industry, uh, the textile and fashion industry in Sweden has a revenue of half the transport industry, double the food industry, four times the electronics industry. So it's quite a big industry for Sweden. And of course, this um, causes a lot of problems related to um, sustainability, especially when you calculate 40% overproduction. So when a fast fashion company produces a shirt, they calculate with 40% overproduction. So if they estimate to sell 1,000 pieces, they produce 1,400 pieces. That, that's normal in the business. And clothes are used on an average 1.5 times in the Western world. And that seems maybe a little, you may be thinking, you know, yeah, I have my jeans, I've had them for 10 years, I use them every day. Yeah, but you probably have around 70% of your wardrobe that you are not using at all. And the overproduction here, the 40%, are not worn once. So, in general, we are at that level. Uh, here are some articles from Sweden uh, from last month. The first saying uh, Ghana in Africa, they're saying, please don't send more clothes. We don't want more of your clothes that you throw away. At the same time, uh, we had another article uh, with Shine uh, promoting ultra fast fashion. If you know what fast fashion is, well ultra fast fashion is using influencers and TikTok and hopefully get everyone to change clothes several times a day. So when you put these two together you've got to be thinking what the, right? What are we doing? And this is why we need that transformation and the creativity. So some other facts, I, I, would, I should, should not dwell too much on this, but normally we say that in Sweden we are very good at recycle and actually I would argue that we are the best on recycling. But when it comes to textile, that doesn't help. 1% of the textiles maximum you can actually recycle to become new textiles. So basically you can't really recycle textiles now. We probably will uh, soon, but now we cannot. So none of the textiles basically that you wear and you, you give away uh, will be recycled at all. 50% uh, of the impact on the environment comes from once you have the textile. So the dyeing and the transport is the most uh, polluting parts. And they exist even if you uh, recycle textile. So it's, a, it's a becoming a big problem and also when you give away your clothes, you typically think that they will be in use somewhere. Well, uh, some news for you, 20% might be in use. So of all the clothes that you give away to other people or to collecting or whatever you do, uh, about 20% will be used or reused somewhere. The rest will be energy recycled, if you know what that is. Okay. Uh, and we're not very good at um, recycling in general. There was a recent report uh, from Resource that showed that 3.4% uh, circularity exists in Sweden. 
That's not completely true uh, because uh, we do cycle a lot more, recycle a lot more. This is not only the textile industry, that is in general. But 3.4% is the amount that we can verify. So we can verify that 3.4% of everything that we recycle is really recycled. So that's the situation today. Uh, another small insight here, uh, the last one before we go back to creativity. Um, Materials. You see here that the green bar here uh, represents cotton, and that hasn't grown. You know, we, we are more people in the world, but still the level of cotton produced is the same that has been the last 40 years. And the only reason for that is that there is not, not enough earth to grow more cotton. So we have already hit the limit way, way back. Uh, we cannot grow more cotton. So when we get more people in the world, where do all the textile come from? Everyone uses five garments. Well, it's polyester, and polyester is oil. So that's where the increase in garments come from. Okay, so uh, based on this, uh, we think that scenarios is very good to get people going. So we created some, uh, some um, scenarios in Science Park Boros. And uh, one thing, uh, this is actually, we started working on five years ago. Uh, we started thinking, saying, you know, you could probably stop buying clothes for a year and it wouldn't be a problem. So what if people did that? So we did an experiment. We got these 10 lovely women, to, uh, which consider themselves to be shopaholics. Uh, and we got them to sign a contract to not buy any new garments in six months. So uh, they, they decided to go for that. And the important thing here, we said that they are not allowed to buy any new garments. They were allowed to buy services like repair, remake, refresh services, but not any new garments. And uh, the result from the experiment was that at the end of this period, they said that we consume much more fashion, we Instagram much more, we are, you know, living fashion much more than before, but we don't buy anything new. Going to the stores, it's very boring because everything looks the same. So they had found a way to use from friends, relatives, garments, remake them, and they live more, uh, more fashionistas. Uh, so interesting love, we also invited the companies, the fast fashion companies, uh, to talk to these guys because we said, well, here's your future customers uh, to get that mix uh, and, and try to understand, you know, how can we solve this? How can we work with this? Uh, so it was a very good experiment and uh, the year after it scaled up. So it was in 10 places around Sweden and uh, we had thousands of followers to the Instagram account in Sweden, so it exploded. No marketing at all, only driven by the insights of the customers. So this is one way that we created a demand from the companies, for, from, from the customers to the companies in order to drive this change. So that's one scenario. Another scenario uh, that we are working on now is what if clothes can talk? You know, I said that maybe 70% of your wardrobe you never use. What if they could talk? So what we are uh, trying to find out is that, uh, let's say it could be something like this. You walk out the door and then you get a, a push uh, in your mobile. So it says something like this. Well, now I can't not read, read really hard, but uh, it says, you know, well, don't you like me anymore? Maybe you get an SMS from your jacket saying, you know, I don't you like you, me anymore? So, and, and then you, the, it answers, well, it's not me. It is, uh, and then you have a dialogue going th out through the door where the jacket actually can sell itself uh, on the uh, eBay or the Tradera, like that. Would that be possible? Well, yes. What we actually found was a ship because one of the problems working with garments is that if you want to send something to your phone, you typically need a battery. And battery in clothes is no good because you need to wash the clothes and normally don't work. So we found this little ship that actually is harvesting energy from the air, from the radio waves 
enough to push our messages to a phone. So we don't need any battery. We can do this right now and we can have the garment talk to us. So we have, again, if you recall the numbers, uh, we have a couple of millions clothes that could start talking to us and try to be able to share each other without our, our knowledge. Um, another um, thing we work on, a uh, scenario we work on right now, is uh, for robots to handle textiles. And most people think that's very easy, but a robot could pick a coffee cup, it could pick a, a screwdriver, but if you toss a t-shirt, you don't know what it is. It looks different every time. So it's very, very hard for robots to pick textiles. Uh, so that is what we are working on, of course. And what we're trying to do now is to create a sort of a remake machine. So you see that little parrot on the, on the yellow shirt there. It's actually an overproduction. It's an overproduction uh, where it wasn't sold. Anyone, no one wanted to buy these yellow shirts. So what we did, we embroidered a parrot on it. Uh, and after we did that small design change, all the yellow shirts were sold online at full price. I think it was 300 shirts uh, within three weeks. So that small parrot increased the value of the garments from nothing to full price. And what if we can do that automatically in Sweden with robots? Then we have a huge market. So that's one thing that we are experimenting right now. Last example here, a uh, thing we did uh, with transparency. We said, what if we could have 100% trustworthy transparency? So what we did together with Gina Tricot and Paper Tail, we created this app that you see here. And we actually went to Australia, uh, interview the cotton farmers. We went to Bangladesh and interviewed the people weaving the, the fabrics. And we put all this into an app. We also measured the energy consumption when sewing these garments uh, for the specific garments. And all that we connected to the specific garments of this ship with blockchain technology so it could be trusted and not altered. So we used NFC, blockchain, apps, uh, and full transparency. And the interesting thing here was, you know, are people willing to buy this? Because what Gina said that we also want economically um, transparency. So these garments had the price that was four times as high as a regular garment. We put this out uh, on the online shops and it took, how long do you think it took before they were sold out? How Estimation? Many? How many? It was around 300 garments. Two days? Yeah, two hours actually. <laughs> Uh, so it was a small collection, so you cannot really make any decision based on that, but at least it got Gina uh, understanding that, yes, the customer are willing to pay if they can trust that the transparency is there. If we just make general assum assumptions, no. But if you can trust it through blockchain, yeah, we're willing to pay as much as four times uh, the price. Um, so... Uh, one minute before I close, I want you to talk to the people next to you and think about what are your scenarios. So talk to the one next to you, say what are your scenarios in your business. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. So if you want, if you want your uh, colleagues to make it easy for them to be creative, you have to uh, come up with some scenarios. If you don't come up with any scenarios, you can join us at Science Park Bros and think about our scenarios if you like. Uh, the thing is that what you also need to do when you have these scenarios, when you have created this and have the ideas, you can really bring the future to now. And you see how I ended with now <laughs> there, right? <laughs> so, uh, well, thank you everyone for listening to me and have a nice Friday.